Stephen Fink. Yeah, and you know, one of the things also when we... Excuse me, kid flash. 
conscious of fix good for him. Uh, you know, one of the things that's important is when we meet with our licensors, it's very important to meet with you know the producers and the writers, and they really give us a download of what these characters are like and what the show is like. You know, in this particular case, you know, Kid Flash looks a little different, so it's very important that we kind of get an understanding of what the character is like, how he's different than existing, you know, superheroes and stuff like that. So having the reference and talking to those guys make a huge difference. Okay, so when we're developing a line of product, we have to determine what route we want to go after. Um, sometimes, as you know, Mattel does a lot of different types of product. Mm -hmm. Product specific for collectors all the way to young kids. In this particular case, as you can see here, a high-end figure would be a super articulated figure with a lot of daddy, all the way down to a mini figure with very limited articulation and very little decor and everything in between. So it's very important for us to figure out what the property is who we feel is going to be into that property and make the toy accordingly, okay? So in terms of articulation, like I said, you can go from super articulated all the way down to very minimal, but there is so much articulation we can do with some of these things that we have done in particular brands, like our uh, wrestling figures and other DC products. But there's, you know, ball joints, arms, flat discs, endoskeleton, where literally we do the skeleton inside the figure and mold a rubber type material around it so you never see any of the joints in the figure. But there's a lot of ways we can approach a figure in terms of articulation. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's one thing that we're constantly trying to do on the action figure side is, you know, what is the right amount of articulation, right? Because you can go from, you know, three points to five points all the way up to just endless articulation. So where's that balance between lots and lots of articulation? Because what happens is the more articulation you put in, the less cool it looks, right? Because you gotta break the joints here, cut here. So you lose some of the aesthetic balances between how much articulation and what the figures looks like. So it's a real balance, you know, when we first take a look at it. That's why it's so important to understand the property, right? To know how many articulation points we need to put in there. Okay, so in this particular case, we did a six inch uh, kid flash figure and we did it in a guy like I said, so that was the product offer. We wanted something cool, kind of like an unleashed approach to some of these characters. So six inch figure, we have quite a bit of articulation there. Um, so the next slide will show the parts breakdown. What this figure is going to need to do, how much articulation is in this figure, where it's going to move, um, some of the different variants we can do for different heads and what the accessory will look like. Next slide, please. Then we kind of focus in more on the accessories and how they're going to work on the figure. We describe the base that the figure is running on a little bit more. We have to get all this information uh, together to get a conscious approval from the licensor because we cannot proceed to any type of production without an approval from the licensor, first and foremost. And at that point, they need to make sure that whatever we're doing is good for the brand and good for the character. Yeah, and, you know, we do a really good job of working with the licensors and making sure that, number one, the concept is true to life to what that property is. And this is obviously Young Justice, right? And we get their feedback and we make sure that they actually agreed on that this is actually the right product, so the right look, the right articulation for it. And in this particular case, everything down to the base, to, you know, whatever accessory it has, you know, has, has to get licensed or approved. Yeah, and also, too, at this point, it's kind of a collaborative uh, effort where they'll give us input and maybe even give us some direction. And a lot of times we even actually work with the animators themselves and they're in some of these meetings, so they kind of give a little bit more of their insights and maybe a little bit of input as well. Okay. So talk about sculpting, right? Because you know, when it comes to the action figure stuff, it's all about sculpting. So one of the things about sculpting is, you know, we have a small army of sculptors out here. Obviously we have, internally you can tell we have a group of very talented guys call them our internal sculptors, and they'll work on everything within the tell, for both boys, for girls, whatever that is, an extremely talented group of guys, surprisingly small group, probably about 10 to 12 people, not that many people. And then of course, we also partner with great guys like General Giant and Four Horsemen, I know some of the Four Horsemen mm -hmm. are here, those of you who know the Four Horsemen are. Excuse me, he's out there somewhere. <laughs> And then, of course, we also work, believe it or not, with global. You know, we've worked with a lot of sculptors in Japan, in China, in Hong Kong, uh, sometimes in the UK. So we have a very diverse bandwidth in terms of where we can dedicate sculpting from and how we want to do it. And again, it depends on what the property is. You know, if it's 
a lot of detail, you know, we'll probably work with uh, the four horsemen. It really depends on what the property is and how we want to execute it. Uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Okay, so Stolte. Uh, a lot of times this is the first tangible item you get to see. It's really cool when you can get to like, view the actual physical manifestation of a piece of artwork. Uh, so at this point we're reviewing it and look at it. Uh, and the next step would be an approval from the licensor. But usually, nine times out of ten, there's a little bit of stuff you have to tweak because since we are the gatekeepers, we're the license, we need to make sure that the product that we sold to put out in the market matches the reference of customers possible. So that leads us to revisions, which is the next slide. So here we'll just make, I mean, it's a little thing. It's, oh, make the, the ears a little smaller. Can you make the hair a little sharper? We just really got to make sure that whatever we put out that matches the reference we're given because we want to make the best product possible and we want to give you the closest manifestation of what you see on TV in product. Yeah, you know, this is a, that's a, this is a real tricky part because this is where the, the finesse comes in. Because sometimes, you know, I'm sure you guys have action figures and poses and stuff like that. Depending on where you put the joint and how far the, you know, the movement is, just a little bit of removing the material and adding the material makes a big difference in terms of how it articulates as well as how it looks. So this is a time when we really kind of get into the nitty gritty and these guys do a really good job of getting into the details of the musculature, making sure it's right, making sure that it's articulated right. Because once we nail this down, it's pretty much set in stone. So that just, that's just the figure, but we also have to make sure that the base is representative of what we originally designed. Uh, the concept that we gave was a kid flash running on the street and he's tearing it up and it's like a street sign getting blown out. We need to make sure that it's matching the control art we gave in the sculpture. So everything has to be represented to the best possible uh, end product because we need to make sure that our concept is being realized in the sculpture. Yeah, and the, also the important thing here is right around here is when we need to figure out how these things are actually physically made, right? Are these things manufacturable? things break apart, how do we pack them out, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but this is right around now where we engage heavily into with the engineers and people that, uh, that actually make the toys to make sure that all the pieces and all the parts uh, fit together properly and that they're all manufactured. Yeah, that's a really huge part of our job is working with engineers that are talented and we're going to tell them. We'll tell us the best way to realize the stuff that we want to do and make sure that everything we make is manufactured, as Steve said how it's broken down, what materials we're going to make stuff out of. So once again, that gives us a base. Next step. So once we're done with sculpt, we get it sent in for approval, and the next step is deco approval. What we'll do is we'll get the sculpt, we'll paint it up, or the four horsemen in this particular case do a beautiful job of painting them ourselves for us. Uh, and then we make sure that that matches the reference and we send it off for approval. Yeah, you know, this is the fun part, right? Because once you put color on these things, they come to life, right? So depending on how many deco we put on, you know, it makes a big difference. And, you know, it's always a challenge to kind of determine how many can, how many deco hits can we afford, uh, what's the right deco, where do you put the deco, and all that other kind of stuff. And again, you know, it's all about what the original property is and how we can bring them to life. And that goes for the base as well. Anything as part of the concept, the original concept, has to have a deco approval. If you miss a piece, we can't proceed with it until we get license approval. It's very important that we are all on the same page and the licensor is aware of what we're doing and we make sure that they are aware at all times so that the process is smooth and they get the best product out of it. So at this point, uh, depending on how the sculpt is sculpted, because there's traditional sculpting where you use wax, or clay, and then there's digital sculpting. But in this particular case, when we use the four horsemen, we have to digitize their sculpts. So that means the, the sculpts are literally scanned, and they're, to, they're made into data that we can then output at any size we need to. At this point, we're also looking to make sure that all the articulation is there, everything is represented that we gave them, a sculpt that we turned over is being represented in this digital sculpt. That goes to the accessories, the base, the figures, that everything included in the product. So at this point, we're making sure that the digital skull still matches the original concept and make sure that everything fits appropriately. The accessories fit on the ones. The articulation is where we want it to be. The base has translated from a traditional skull to a digital skull. 
We're looking to make sure that all those little nuances that the Fort Horseman or any sculpture gives us are represented in the digital, in the digital sculpture. All right, so now that we have kind of sort of figure sculpted, we know how much deco we can put on, we make sure everything is right. Next we talk about packaging, right? Now, packaging guys follow a very similar process. <laughs> you start off with a sketch. What does a package look like? Is it a box? <laughs> is it a blister card? What is that thing? So it's, from a process standpoint, it's very similar. You start off with a sketch, right? Then they will do a mock-up. We call it a white structure. Get it? White structure, right? <laughs> so it, that is a physical representation of what the idea is. And what they'll do is they'll make sure that the product fits, where you're going to put the graphics, uh, you know, are you going to, where you're going to put the accessories, we call it a pack out, right? How are you going to pack out the figures? So right around here is when they figure that out. And of course, eventually, we end up with a final package. So again, from a process standpoint, it's fairly similar to how, how we design the action figure stuff. And typically, we work as a team to make sure that obviously, the package and the product works well together in terms of, you know, you know, is it packed out right? Can you see the figure? So on and so forth. And now, I think, All right. now we're going to turn it over to Derek to talk a little bit about how this is where, now that we've kind of sort of designed the thing, now it's time to execute. Now it's time to actually physically make it. Right, Derek? Right. So this is tooling model. So this is kind of last call before you go into the tooling process, which is really the last point where you want to start making changes. Tooling models, the tooling model is where you make sure that you are doing the thing according to what the license are approved, you have all the articulation you want, you have all the accessories you want. This is the point where if you're missing anything, you've got to get it done now. Because one of the longest segments of your production is your tooling time and you're spending a lot of money. So if anything goes wrong after tooling, you're in trouble. Yeah, so you want to get all those things. What's a tool? A tool, which we'll go into detail in the next slide. Good question. Uh, and actually, we have two models for basic accessories as well. So we want to make sure all those components are ready to go at the same time. Uh, and that's the first shot. Uh, all right, so we'll say a tool is your steel mold that you inject the plastic into in manufacturing. Uh, and it's a really elaborate process that takes months to get done. Uh, every single part that you're injecting plastic in needs a steel mold. Uh, and even though a figure is very small, steel tool is very large. So even a mold for a head is probably a 12 by 12 block of solid steel. It weighs about as much as an engine block. They have hoists and factories to get these things from place to place. And you need it to be that big because you're injecting liquid plastic into it. And there's a lot of pressure on the mold to make sure that plastic doesn't lose out and all your seam lines are correct. It's a really elaborate process uh, and it takes a lot of time. So you can see, uh, and also, Molds are gauged by tonnage to give you a sense of how much these things weigh. Uh, there's a big clamp that press the pneumatic system that presses the two parts together. You've got a big, basically, syringe on one side that injects the hot plastic into it, and then that separates. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, you have little bits of plastic that will pop up, go into a bucket, and then they're shoveled off to another part of the factory to cut off the stems. Uh, so when we get into materials, uh, you don't want to make something out of just one type of plastic. Uh, go to the next slide. You have uh, PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride, which is a really nice uh, detailed plastic. It a lot of information on it, but it isn't very good at holding together to itself. So you've got to introduce other materials, such as uh, ABS, which I always have to look up because I can never get this right. Uh, Acrylonitrile butamine styrene. What in the heck is that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is really good uh, hard surface material that allows you to capture the arms and legs of the figure and keep it together. It's a very strong, solid material. It doesn't keep the detail as well, but if you get too thick with it, then you start getting deformations. So it's a balance between what type of material you want for each process. Uh, and then for putting the joints together, you have POM, which is polyoxymethylene. Wow, thanks for uh, the reason why we need a shortcut name. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nobody actually says the names when you're at work because it takes way too long. Uh, so PLM is a really nice material. The drawback of it is you can't really paint it. If you paint it, it'll scrape off almost immediately, so you have to inject it in the color you want it to be final. Uh, but it's really strong, really durable, so we use that to pin the whole PC together and then some parts of it. So I know some of you guys had that question when you look at some of your product and say, why is Batman's pin in his elbow? black, but the one in his, it should be gray, 
is because all of the pants will do in the same bowl. So if he has black legs, we're using it, the majority of it for the knees. But unfortunately, we can't separate them for colors. Like for his, his elbow is gray and his, and his knees are black. You just can't do it. So it's one of those things where we try to paint or we'll try to adjust for it later on. But there's one of those things that come regularly. Why are the wider color mismatch in the pants? It also contributes when we have a character with stripes on the outside of the arms or legs that we match. Do we match the arm or do we match the stripe? The POM is a definite consideration. Yeah, yeah, you know, also, you know, that's one of the toughest things when you deal with multiple materials like this is to make sure all the colors match. Because, you know, different materials will mold slightly different. So it's a fine tune between, you know, you can call it the same PMS 132 on the torso, on the legs, on the pins. And you know, when you get the first shots, it's always a little different. So these guys are constantly trying to work with the engineers to fine tune them to make sure that they all match. And that's that's real tricky stuff. Yeah, and, and the color also varies depending on the temperature of light that we're looking at it under. You know, if it's under sunlight, if it's under white light, if it's under fluorescent light. So we have to check under multiple light sources to make sure red matches. So I'm going to uh, deco a little bit. So anybody who looks at the WWE figures, there is a massive amount of deco on the WWE figures. What's the uh, massive amount? What, what's the <laughs> massive amount? How many deco hits are we talking about? Uh, well, it depends on whether you're talking basic figures or elite figures. Or basic figures probably have 40 to 50 different spots of color on every figure. Elite figures can have anywhere from 40 on the low end. We've gone up to, I think, 160. To put that in perspective, guys, a Batman figure, like for an animated show, probably has about 20, 25. And a movie master, which we do our super high-end, you know, authentic to movie, have about 100 plus. They, they just, they get a lot of that. So, and for that, we have a lot of guys with really distinct tattoos, and you want to make sure that you're representing those precisely and get them to wrap around the form correctly. Uh, so this is tampo printing. This is basically, you'll have a little area where the paint comes up and you can see the logo there, or this tattoo there. And it'll come up and these little rubber stoppers on the left hand side will pick up each individual color, slide over and press down on the individual part and leave deco on that part. And each stopper would have a different color. So as it goes down the process, you're picking up the orange and then you're picking up the blue and then you're picking up the black and front down the line. It's very similar to the silk screening process that. So if you want to think really crisp and clean, the tampo process is probably good. So spray masks. Spray masks are great when you want uh, larger specific areas of color that you're getting one color. Uh, so areas like the belts, uh, you can also do over sprays. So this is all airbrush process. Uh, so like where you have transparency on the left and you're just doing light areas of paint over the top, that's spraying. Uh, and then on the right, the big jobs of gook that you see, are actually your spray mask, which is a copper plate, and they cut a hole in it that lines up with the belt, whatever that area is. Uh, the drag the spray mask is that after about 10 passes, you've got to go in with a wire brush to clean up the spray mask again to make sure that your area is nice and crisp and clean. Otherwise, you get a lot of hazing and you get a lot of deformity in your spray mask. Hand brush is pretty much what it sounds like. We use this for pick up texture and detail in sculpted form, so when we're in one, crusty shape on something or we want to pick up the recessed hair detail, we'll use hand brushing. Yeah, so this is quite a bit of artistry to it. It, it. it depends on what factory we will choose to do this product with because as you can tell with hand brushing, there's quite a bit of skill involved as well because with the tampo process you saw earlier with the mask, they're relatively straightforward because once you get it registered right and you have the mask on, it pretty much goes on just the way you want it. But with hand brushing, there's still a lot of subjectivity, a lot of skill involved. So we got to make sure we pick the right manufacturer who, can, who have people that can know how to do this stuff and make sure that they all look right. And then we have the UN, vacuum metalized, uh, which everybody loves and looks great and shiny. It's very, very expensive. <laughs> uh, so we tend to keep it to very specific things that we want to really show off. We'll use it on our elite figures, we use it on belts. Uh, you guys can use it on some of your uh, Warner Brothers pieces. Yeah, so you really want to show off and have something shine. Assembly. Uh, so if you go down to the, to the Mattel booth in the WWE section, you'll see a CM Punk, which is a first shot figure. That's the first colors that come off the line. Uh, and we have it basically spread out so you can see all the individual parts that make up that figure. 
if you open up the figure, there's buffer pads and a lot of the extra parts that you've never even seen, but they have to be there to make sure that you get friction on the joints, otherwise you've got arms that just flop around and have no tension. So there's PVC pads and ABS pads and buffer pads and a whole lot of things that in production you've got to make sure those are all slotted in and that's perfect. And shipping. This is actually shot of one of the uh, factories where they're basically prepping all the boxes to go out. Uh, and they ship it out by a container that would pop them on the tables. Development timeline. Uh, and I think some of this was specific to the baby. Uh, if we do a really quick turnaround on a process where we have all the tooling done, we can do stuff in about five months. Uh, but a typical Mattel process can be up to 18 months, especially for really complicated things. Uh, so if you're seeing Superman movie stuff that came out, we're working on that a year before the movie comes out or earlier, so it's a very long film process, uh, which means we've got to work hand in hand with the licensors to make sure that we get everything right. Yeah, usually with the movie stuff, you know, like Eric said, you know, it takes us about a year, year and a half to do that, but, you know, we'll typically see and read the scripts even before that, so, you know, if you look at the time, it's at least a year, so all the stuff that you're seeing, on shelf now. We started on this stuff a year, year and a half ago. So that's how long it takes for us to do some of this stuff. Uh, and distribution time timeline came up because we've had a lot of discussions before about why does Walmart have it before Toys R Us before somebody else. So we'll ship something out from our factories and some of those retailers will pick it up direct from the factories and others will have it ship it to the US and then they pick it up over here. So a lot of those timetables of each retailer and how long it takes them to get the product shipped around. Some will bring it to a distribution center and then they'll send it to regional distribution centers that they'll send it back to other groups. So there can be anywhere from weeks to months difference between how the retailers handle their product. And that concludes our presentation on action figures. <laughs> Like 
we, we have a lot of consumer product integrity regulations that we have to manage. And of course, to tell we're very concerned about putting out a high quality product. So yes, the amount of, like what Derek was talking about, tension on joints. You want to make sure ankles stand up, and you, can, you know, uh, you want to make sure none of the pieces are deformed. You want to make sure that all the paint masks are properly applied. Uh, what's the melting point? Are there any sharp points? That plays a lot into our material choice. You know, PVC is much safer and softer, so Batman's head and ears will always be PVC, so no one gets a boat. And these those plastics have a wide range of how hard those plastics can be made in. So if there's concern, we can make something that's very, very soft PVC to make sure it's a little bit. So yeah, we're a, a lot of testing, it's very expensive. Also, too, there is an entire division of the company in Asia that is devoted to testing every bit of product that we put out, and they put it through rigorous testing, aging, heat, drop test. There's, there is a test for everything that could possibly damage your toy. We make sure that our toys are very durable and meet all those things and see many of them. I would say without a doubt that all tests test their products more than any other toy. Okay. Yeah. We have people whose only job is to set fire to toys. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true, right, Scott? Or fighting them, or pull them, throw them across the room. So you can grow up to be a toy burglar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey guys, I was uh, wondering, uh, since uh, the WWE superstars there at gimmicks and their uh, appearances and whatnot are changing so often from hairstyles to outfits to uh, new uh, tattoos, uh, is that a challenge for you trying to get the you know, new design and have you ever had to scrap a new design because they change from one to another so quickly? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. One of the prime examples is CM Punk. Uh, there was a period within three months that he changed his beard, he shaved his head, wore a mask, got stubble back, shaved it again, and we did six different heads in that timetable trying to get it approved. And the thing with WWE is, it's whatever happened on Monday Night Raw or on SmackDown is what the figure needs to look like. So wherever we're at in the process, it needs to look like whatever just happened. You know, that's one of the things that's very true. You know, that's where the digital technology really helps us these days. You know, when he does change, his hair or whatever that is, you know, a lot of these, these days, most of their heads are digitally scanned, so we save a ton of time in terms of, you know, starting a, a sculpt from scratch, and we'll just take that digital data and we'll tweak it, we'll, you know, we'll manipulate it to make sure that it's right, so that saves a tremendous amount of time. And one of the biggest issues we have is when a guy is off the roster. Because when a guy is off the roster, we no longer have the rights to make him. If it's a certain part of the process, we can still make it, but there's a cutoff there. So there have been times in the past where we had a figure that was pretty much out the door, and he got cut from the roster, we had to hold him from line. At which point, you're putting out six figures in a way, and you've got to quickly figure out some other guy to fill in that void, and still ship it out of time. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of balance. Yeah. I had to you. <laughs> Hi. I just wondered, uh... How does Mattel determine the size of uh, production runs to, uh, for each figure? And uh, does Mattel keep uh, just the big, big warehouses of the uh, completed pre uh, mold molded tools so that uh, if a figure turns out to be more popular, if a property is popular, that they can do additional runs or perhaps reuse some of the cards for future figures? That's it. That's you, Scott. That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a marketing question. Um, so your first question about quotas, there's a, there's a couple ways Mattel does that. Um, for the most part, 99% of what Mattel makes is aimed at kids and moms. So quotas are usually set when very early in the process when we work with our retail partners, like your Targets, your Walmart, your Toys R Us, your Entertainment Earth, everybody. And we find out how many toys they want. And that's usually, you know, that's kind of, that's the big picture way of, of you know, setting quota. Another way, when you're dealing with things like collector lines, like a Madden collector, the, the kind of Kickstarter thing we've done, like Castle Rayskull, or the subscriptions, we put them out. That's exactly why we do pre-orders for the subscriptions, because when you're dealing with high-end collector stuff, we need to know how many we can sell, and if we have enough customers to sell, because there's this little, there's this newfangled thing called the internet, <laughs> and it tends to give a lot of people voice, and a lot of times the voices, I, 
tend to, to ele elevate artificially the number of fans that there might be. So doing pre-orders or subscriptions or, you know, that's a race call allows us to gauge that so that we can accurately produce, or in the case of some things like the Young Justice 2 pack we did, uh, mm -hmm. talking about Young Justice, we didn't get enough pre-orders, so that item never happened. So there you go. I think you're gonna see a lot more Kickstarter type things for what people in our, you know, our demographic, you know, everyone here in this room, the toys we're into, just as things like prices, labor, things that Mattel has very little control over continue to rise. Being able to lock in quotas for collector stuff is going to be more and more important as the years go. As for whether or not we keep the, the tools around, we do keep them for a certain amount of time, and after a while they often need to get replaced. Popular characters like Batman who might be continuously, sometimes even have the tools redone. If you want to jump in on any... Uh... Yeah, typically on the tools, you know, we keep our tools typically around five years depending on the popularity of the line and the duration of the line. For example, WWE, we've been doing WWE for around our fifth year. So we'll keep those guys around just because we know we're going to continue to do those things. Um, you know, on a movie line, like let's say like The Dark Knight or something like that, you know, we're only going to do it once a year, two years maybe, depending on when the movie comes back or not. And then, you know, that kind of determines how long we keep some of this stuff. So you get a sense of perspective on the WWE line between the basic figures, two packs, at least, per year. We made about six million figures, which is a massive, massive number That's all. per year. I don't know how, but we do it, and there's something like that. It's great. We love it. Uh, but it's enough figures to populate the city every year. So when, even though, okay, just one second. Sorry, Bill. Sorry, Bill. Uh, but we have a huge library of WWE parts that we can always pull from, the boots and heads and other parts that we can pull. Uh, but it's very, very rare that we go back and reproduce a figure from the previous line. If we make them again, we do new deco, we do new head, maybe something else. So even though we do that massive number of figures, the each individual figure is fairly small. It's in the thousands for each run of figure. But when you have that high run, those tools are being constantly yes. upkept. Same with DCU, we are constantly upkeeping those tools just because of how much production. And there are several tools in WWE that we've had to replace because we've worn them out. We've worn them out. Yeah. Like, I know we've had to replace legs. Yeah. A lot of common parts get replaced every couple of years. Great. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Hi. 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 Do you think uh, that 3D printing will change your industry? Ooh, good question. So we are looking into 3D printing. Um, you know, I think for the here and now, uh, probably won't make a big, big impact. You know, we have, you know, a large number of, you know, printing machines back in the office and stuff like that. Uh, I think that's coming in the future. Um, you know, we talked about this uh, just a couple weeks ago, you know, in terms of 3D, 3D printing and how that's going to affect the industry. Uh, you know, more and more people are starting to make their own stuff. Um, but, you know, but with Mattel, you know, we, it's important that our product is a quality product and it's a product that can withstand time. You know, 3D printing with the technology right now doesn't exactly do that, but I think in a couple of years, you will start seeing stuff that will have that level of quality, that level of detail. So I do think it's coming sooner than we think. Yeah, right, you. right now it's like 2000. With the internet, you know it's big, it's out there, but there's not a YouTube yet. You know, it's not clear what direction it's going to be taking. And one of the big things for pre printing is it has to reach a point where it's very easy to use. I mean, all, most people have a 2D just photo printer at home, but how often do you really use it? How many times when you use it is the ink out? <laughs> and if you're doing that with something that costs as much as a 3D printer, a couple times where you get something that half builds and then deforms, you're going to chuck that thing out the window. And the last so thing it has to be reliable. The last thing would be safety because the materials that they make the stuff out of now may not meet our specs at the company. So if we ever do it, it has to meet those specs to be as safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, two quick questions, if that's all right. Uh, one technical. First, you wrote it down. I'm impressed. Thank you. First, you 
Have you guys found that your own personal fandom affects your work positively or negatively? And that makes you feel about what you do, or you might have your own personal differences on where the product should go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Congrats, dude. laughs> Let's take the hand brushing. All right, someone. Yeah. You want to... No, go ahead. All right. Uh, hand brushing is literally what it is, where you have a line of people in the factory, one after another, and they have a brush in their hand, and they do a swipe, and hand it to the person next to them that does another swipe and hand down the line. So it's straight assembly line by hand process. It's one of the few things in manufacturing in China that is done by hand. Almost everything else is a kind of process. And also, too, it's a real art form. Usually the people that are doing that are very skilled and are, they're artists. Um, generally speaking, they'll get such a small part of our manufacturing process now because there's so much other technology that allows us to get those details. But there is still certain times and certain, certain situations where a hand brush, you know, you have to bite by hand. And we, there's, like you said, there's a line of people who are brushing just. Yeah, and it's amazing how fast they are. Yeah, it's, amazing. It's, moving, it's moving incredibly fast. So the next time you see a stubble overspray or wipes on the hair, just think like that is going fast. You know, way quicker than Lucy with the chalk or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the key to that is quality control, right? So whether it's a chemical process, whether it's a spray mask, whether it's hand painted, you know, human beings make mistakes. So the key for us is to make sure that we have a very tight quality control and make sure that everything that gets out there as humanly possible is as perfect and as good quality as we can humanly make it. You know, we're very passionate about that. So that's why, you know, I always say Mattel product is one of the best products out there. Not to pat my back, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's a well-made product. We make absolutely sure that the details are just right. You know, and then to your second part of the question in terms of the passion, wow, you know, everyone on this panel you know, has a passion for everything they work on. You know, I'm a collector myself, more, more of a Star Wars fan, but it's a separate conversation. But you know, every one of these guys, whether it's Derek, whether it's Bill, whether it's Ruben, you know, Ruben has a comic book background. You know, these guys live it every day and they love the passion into putting their heart and souls into making these things. And you know what? And it's all for you guys, right? And, and this is like their dream job. You know, they get to collect, you should see Bill's office actually, it's quite the, it's quite the collection, um, you know, in, in, in itself. So, you know, we're, we're collectors too, you know, we're fans. You know, working on the stuff is just cool, you know, so it's not that hard. And on the right. WB line, I've got to give a shout out to Bill Aquino, because he's really the torchbearer on the WB line. There are numerous times where things will be approved, and we'll see it, like, to, you know, development doesn't like it, but we'll see things the first shot and final sample where he will notice something for the first time and say, no, this has to change, this is not right, we have to make this judgment. And it's that passion he has for him and for everybody else that he wants to make sure this is right and accurate. Yeah, because I mean, I would say to what you said about our relationship, with, like as collectors, we know what we would like to see and we try to stand our ground and stick to our guns and really, we know what will, what will make you guys happy and what will disappoint and you feel a connection that way. And we really, that's why we're very passionate about it. We, we know what we want to have. Thank you guys. Thank you, Rose. Hi. Hi. Um, being the mom of an impressionable little girl, I love that when Barbie has a lot more career options these days that are really popular. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering, are we going to see more with um, her parents like Tattoos and disabilities or diversity. So I think that's something that little girls in America can really sort of have it in their homes and look up to. Yeah, I mean, one of the really great things about the Barbie brand is I have a little girl, so I can I can I can comment. Anyone that's like to play with Barbies at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Blizzard's the guy in, in green dress princess. <laughs> Um, Barbie's all about aspiration. You know, it's one of the key pillars of the Barbie brand. It's like the I, the I can be brand, as it's called. You know, giving girls, you know, a role model and something they can really look up to, especially with the careers. The short answer is yes. Mattel is always looking for new aspirational ways. Uh, you know, for Barbie, whether whether it is attacking or not attacking attacking the issue of people. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, looking looking at issues of disabilities, different ethnicities, different cultures. The short answer is yes. Do we have anything to announce right now? You know, not, not really, especially an action figure panel, but 
that is a huge part of marketing. And I think you're going to see as we go, you know, we start to get farther along with more and more things like that coming out.